Right. So quickly recap first. I hope you now appreciate the distinction between real GDP and nominal GDP. Right? Let's just make sure we, we understand the difference between this and what is called nominal GDP. Does anyone care to explain to me quickly what the difference is? Anyone? What is nominal GDP, say, in the year 2014? What kind of dollars would that be measured in? Remember that now, with the dollar sign, we now have a date. Is that correct? So the dollars from one year are quite different uh, from the, uh, than the dollars from another year. Right, so if you're talking about GDP in the year 2014, and let's say we say that that is $17 trillion, would this be real GDP or nominal GDP? Nominal, exactly. Would we be able to compare this with, uh, say, GDP in 2013, which was, say, $16 trillion? Could you say that 17 is bigger than 16 and therefore uh, Americans are better off in the year 2014 as compared to 2013? Could we say that? No, right? We can't because the two dollars are different dollars. That's a different currency than that. You can think of these as different currencies, right? Because the purchasing power of the dollar, the value of the dollar changes from year to year because because of inflation, because the cost of living rises, correct? So what is real GDP then? How would we compare these two? 16 trillion and 17 trillion. You really can't compare them because they are currently expressed in nominal dollars. So how would we go about comparing these? How would we figure out whether or not Americans are better off in the year 2014? Yes, we would need to convert both of these we would need to convert both of these into a common dollar, which we call base year dollars. And the base year could be any year. We have to designate a year as the base year. Correct? So how would we convert uh, these nominal dollars into real dollars? What we would do is we would measure the physical output. So what we would do is we would take the physical output of goods and services in these two years, but we would evaluate these in what prices? Base year prices. We would take the prices of these goods, apples and oranges, in the base year, and we would convert physical quantities into dollar values using those base year prices. And that would give us GDP expressed in base year dollars, namely real GDP, correct? And then we spend some time looking at the uses of real GDP, correct? You recall what the uses of real GDP are? Quickly. Three main purposes of real GDP. And the first two here involve comparisons across time, and that's what real GDP is for. To compare GDP across time, we need to convert these nominal GDPs into a common currency, real dollars, right? So the number, the first point says to compare the standard, standard of living over time. So that's tracking how Americans are doing over time, meaning to compare GDP this year to GDP, let's say, 10 years ago, right? So we need to use real GDP for that type of comparison. Number two says to track the course of the business cycle. And this too involves a intertemporal comparison, a comparison across time. So what is this, the business cycle? What is the business cycle? We've, we've talked about that briefly. It is the up and down of the economy. The fact that you have an economic expansion, which then becomes a recession, and then back into an expansion, and so on. So how do you know whether your, your economy is in recession? Well, the US government uses a very simple criteria, and that is, that if the real GDP is shrinking for two consecutive quarters, the government says that we are in recession. Right? But in order to figure out whether GDP is in fact shrinking, we need to compare real GDP. We need to look at real GDP this quarter, compare that to real GDP last quarter. 
correct? Because we can't make nominal GDP comparisons, right? So the first two bullet items involve comparisons across time. And the last one is about comparing GDP between countries in order to figure out whether the Japanese are better off than the Americans say. Right, so the third point is about making international comparisons of standards of living. Right? Again, we use real GDP. We compare real GDP in the US to real GDP in, say, Mexico. Correct? But there are problems with this, as we studied very briefly in class last time, in that we can't really take GDP in Mexico. So let's say we have real GDP in Mexico and we have real GDP in the US, right? And uh, again, let's divide these by the populations of these two countries to arrive at a dollar figure per person, correct? So I would call this per capita GDP in Mexico and per capita GDP in, in the US. So what is per capita again? Does anyone recall what per capita means? Per person. Right, so you take GDP in these two countries, real GDP that is, and you divide by the population to get a amount, a money amount per person. And you can think of this as the average income in the economy, income per person. And this is typically used as a measure of the standard of living of a country, just how well off people are. Right? So let's say we want to compare these two. The first problem that we would face, of course, is that the US number is measured in US dollars, whereas the Mexican figure is going to be measured in pesos. Correct? So what is the procedure that is commonly adopted? A procedure, by the way, that is not quite correct. The procedure that is adopted is we convert this into that using the exchange rate. Right? And then we would have Mexican per capita GDP converted into U.S. dollars, and then we can compare that to per capita GDP in the U.S., right? Of course, the Mexican figure is going to be smaller than the U.S. figure. And so we can perhaps say that uh, Americans are better off than the Mexicans, right? But the problem with this is that many things in Mexico, particularly non-tradables, non-tradables are goods and services that can't cross borders, they are intrinsically not tradable. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that the prices of non-tradables could be greatly different across borders. Now, let's consider a car. Is a car a non-tradable or a tradable? Somebody. It's a tradable. A car can be easily shipped across borders. Is that correct? Right now, what does a typical mid-sized sedan cost in the States? these days? In the vicinity of $25,000, would you agree? How much does a car like that cost in Mexico somebody? Is, is there a, a, a Mexican nationally or somebody who travels across the border frequently? Anyone? And I was told in one of my other classes that uh, a similar car in Mexico costs about the same, perhaps even a little bit more. You follow me? So a car that costs about $25,000 in the States costs about the same in Mexico. And why is that? And that's because the car is a tradable. If there was a significant price difference, if cars were, let's say, more expensive in the States than in Mexico, some smart guy would do the following. He would buy cars in Mexico cheaply and sell it in the US at a higher price, making a profit. Correct? And people would do this, thereby increasing the supply of cars in the States until the price of cars in the States fell to the Mexican level. Correct? So the point I'm trying to make here is that when you consider tradables, there really shouldn't be a price difference across borders. But when you consider non-tradables, goods that can't be shipped across borders, then you arrive at significant price differences. And give me an example of a non-tradable. Somebody. Any thoughts? What is a good that really intrinsically can't be shipped across borders? A good or a service? Hmm? Consider a haircut, right? Can a haircut be shipped from Mexico to the States? No. The barber could come across, right? 
But of course, immigration laws wouldn't permit him to do that, right? But the haircut itself or the services of a Mexican dentist, etc., these are things that are non-tradable. So they can't be shipped across borders. That is why a haircut is, is way cheaper in Matamoros than it is in Brownsville. And lots of people go to, across the border to get braces and dental work done. Is that correct? Because those prices are way cheaper there, even when you convert it into dollars. Even when you use the exchange rate to convert the cost of braces for your teeth. If you convert that into US dollars, it's still way cheaper than it is here. Is that correct? Which is why people argue that the exchange rate conversion, this particular conversion here, is inappropriate. It is inappropriate because of the significant differences in the prices of non-tradables across borders. Correct? So when you use the exchange rate, the Mexican, the average Mexican will seem much poorer compared to the average American poorer than he really is. Correct? Now, somebody who earns, let's say, 3,000 U.S. equivalent in Mexico is quite a well-off person. On the other hand, $3,000 a month in the States would put you in lower middle class types these days. Correct? So, in order to take account of this, Economists argue that we ought to be using something called purchasing power parity. And that is right here. Purchasing power parity, which is an alternative to the exchange rate. And what this is about is it, it really takes into account the fact that the cost of living is much lower in Mexico than in the States. Lower because non-tradables are much cheaper in Mexico, right? So in this, by this procedure, we take the physical quantities of apples and oranges produced in Mexico, but we convert them into U.S. dollars, not by first converting them into pesos and then into dollars. Rather, we use U.S. prices to convert the output of Mexico, the physical output of Mexico, into U.S. dollars directly, correct? And then we can compare that dollar amount to real GDP in, in the States. So this is roughly the purchasing power parity method of comparing per capita GDP across countries. And now we will talk quickly about the limitations of real GDP. And the first limitation is household production. Now what is household production? This is the production of final goods and services by households for their own consumption. So this would be something like growing vegetables in your backyard. If you, let's say, grew, let's say that you had a large backyard and you were an enthusiastic gardener, you could every year, let's say, grow 100 pounds of tomatoes for your own consumption, correct? Now, would you consider this output to be part of GDP? Should it be part of GDP? No, it should. Don't you think it should? Because it is the production of a final good. You are the end user of that good, correct? In a sense, what you are doing is you are producing these 100 pounds of tomatoes and you are, in a sense, buying these tomatoes yourself. Right? Since you're buying it from yourself, money doesn't really change hands. Money goes from one pocket into another. Think of it that way. Right? Now, 100 pounds of tomatoes, what's the uh, dollar value of 100 pounds of tomatoes? To figure that out, you'd have to work out, the, you'd have to get the uh, prevailing market price of tomatoes from, let's say, HEB. Right? And let's say the price of tomatoes in HEB is $2 a pound. So your 100 pounds of tomatoes would be valued then at $200. That's $200 worth of final goods being produced. However, does the government have any way of observing this? No. The government doesn't observe this, you see. We don't really live in this futuristic uh, world. You know, have, you, have you heard of a famous novel called 1984 by George Orwell? And in that novel, the government keeps an eye on everyone. There is a, a, a camera in every living room. Big Brother is watching you, so to speak. Right? But if, if that doesn't happen, then, of course, the government has no, no idea what, what you're producing for your own consumption. 
Now, this could be significantly important in a country, in a third world country, right? Let's consider a country like even, say, Mexico. And you have, let's say, a small farmer in Mexico who grows corn. And let's say this farmer consumes half his own corn crop. So he's growing corn on uh, a few acres of land, right? And he consumes half of his own crop. His own family consumes it. Only half is sold. The Mexican government is likely going to observe only the part that is being sold in the market. You follow me? The government economists who calculate GDP need to follow a paper trail of receipts, correct? And so the only production that they keep track of is production that is associated with sales receipts, right? So only half of the farmer's output, the, the part that is being actually sold, is recorded by the government. The other half that he consumes himself is missed by the government, correct? So in, in many poor countries, a large fraction of agricultural output may be simply lost may be unrecorded by the government. So this is the point about household production. The fact that the official GDP figure may be smaller than true GDP. The official figure may be an underestimate. Right? The second point here is underground production. Now, in this category, we are now talking about production that is actually bought and sold. So unlike household production, which isn't bought and sold, because you are, in a sense, buying it from yourself. In underground production, there is a transaction happening. People are buying and selling these, these goods and services, only these transactions are hidden from the government. Right? They are part of the underground economy. Now, can you give me an example of a transaction like that, that is part of the underground economy? In other words, money is changing hands. Money is changing hands, but there is no paper trail for the government to follow. Any thoughts? Are we necessarily talking about illegal substances here? Or could it be something legal even? It could be something legal even, right? Somebody who comes to your uh, house and mows your lawn, let's say, and you pay him $40 cash, and he doesn't report this to anyone, you don't report it to anyone. On the other hand, $40 worth of final lawn mowing services were provided you, but this $40 worth of production was completely missed by the government because there was no paper trail. Correct? So these could be perfectly legal activity. It's just that these are hidden from the government, mainly because the, the involved parties don't want to pay any kind of tax to the government. Right? But this could also in, include illegal activities. Right? Consider all the uh, you know, the large quantity of drugs that are consumed by Americans. You know what the size of the annual uh, illegal drug market is every year? Do you know what value of illegal drugs Americans buy every year? Give me a second. Give me a figure. Any thoughts? Well, the figure that I, I've recently read is 60 billion. That's the size of the drug market of the States. Now, that ought to be part of GDP, shouldn't it? Right? We're not concerned about whether the stuff is good or bad for you. Remember, we count cigarettes, don't we? We count cigarettes. So why don't we count illegal drugs? The point is, we ought to, but we, we can't, because these transactions are hidden from the government. Another big uh, uh, part of underground production would be uh, moonshine liquor, home-brewed alcohol, which is, by the way, there's a huge market for it. In fact, it's quite fashionable in, in, in our large cities, you know, cities like New York and Chicago. In many of the blues bars and things in Chicago, they will sell you moonshine liquor in a, in a jar, you know, uh, the way, you know, people in the deep south used to consume it in the old days, you know. So, so there is a big market for that, and uh, this is something that's being completely missed by the government. So that's underground production. So what's the uh, significance of underground production again? As a result of that, the official GDP figure is an underestimate of true GDP. Okay, the other two limitations here are first, leisure time. Now remember, GDP or real GDP is supposed to tell us something about, this is supposed to tell us something about our well-being. 
It's supposed to tell us about how well off Americans are. GDP by the income approach, that is, correct? Because GDP is also the income of households. And that is supposed to tell us about how well off Americans are. But GDP doesn't take into account a very important component of our well-being, which is leisure. Right? GDP is only concerned about production. So you might have two countries, and one country has very high GDP, per capita GDP. But in this country, people only get 10 days off a year, if that. Does that sound like a country that you are familiar with? Hmm? A country where people just get about 10 days off a year? Your own country, correct? Now let's compare that with a country where every year around, around August, all the offices in the country shut down pretty much. Everyone's on holiday for a month. Can you think of that country? Yes, France, France. Many of these European countries have very generous vacation time. Right? So you have two countries, one where everyone's working all the time, producing lots of GDP. In the other country, they're producing less GDP, but they get a lot of leisure time. How are you to compare them, you know, compare well-being across these countries? If you go by per capita GDP alone, then the US will see much better than France. Right? But once you take into account the generous vacation time that the French worker gets, then it, it becomes more confusing. Correct? So this is another weakness of GDP as a measure of economic well-being, because it ignores leisure. Also, GDP ignores environmental quality. So again, you might have a country like China, which is rapidly becoming developed. Chinese GDP, not per capita GDP, but GDP, without dividing by the population. Some people say if you use the purchasing power parity method, Chinese GDP is now bigger than US GDP. Correct? China is the world's largest economy now. If you use purchasing power parity, not the exchange rate, the PPP, to convert Chinese GDP into dollars. If you do that, the Chinese economy is the largest in the world. Right? But this has come at a great cost to China. China is a country where the air is highly polluted. In, in Beijing, for instance, capital of China, the air quality is extremely poor. It's always smoggy all the time because of vehicular pollution and factory pollution and so on. The rivers, the great rivers of China are completely choked with chemicals. Right? So all this has come at this great cost. So they have great GDP, but look at the, uh, the environmental cost of it. Right? So when you think about GDP as a measure of well-being, human well-being, then of course we ought to take into account environmental quality. The side effects of producing GDP is pollution. And that really ought to be taken into account. Right? And GDP, unfortunately, doesn't. Also, GDP doesn't look into, take into account things like health and life expectancy. GDP doesn't take into account things like political freedom and social justice. And so these are all limitations of GDP as a measure of economic well-being, okay? And that brings me to the end of the chapter. We have a small appendix here, but I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to leave you to read it, okay? And this brings me to the end of, of uh, chapter five. We will now shortly launch into chapter six, but I will end this recording and start a new